So, we are finally going to embark on the second half of this semester, although it's ironic we're starting the textbook with chapter one here, uh, and we are halfway through the semester. We are officially going to begin the cell biology portion of the course, and so we're starting at the beginning of the text, and this lecture is entitled Introduction to Cells. We're going to talk first about different cells being very different from each other in many different ways and talk about all of those differences and what we can learn from them. We'll move on then and talk about some of the basic shared biochemistry between cells in a very uh, crude and brief way, no details here, just to get a sense for how the similarities between cells are just informative as their differences. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the microscope and what an influential effect the microscope had on cell biology. And by the microscope, we mean cellular magnification of all kinds, starting with a very simple compound mi microscope and going all the way to electron microscopy. We'll talk about prokaryotes in brief, just to get a sense for how those cells are different from eukaryotic cells, which we'll spend much more time on. And then we'll take a tour of the average eukaryotic cell, looking at all of the different organelles that those cells have, and looking at what the roles of those organelles are. We'll wrap up with a brief discussion of the cytoskeleton and model organisms as well, how we use different types of organisms to learn different things. And it should be pointed out that although we're going to be talking about organelles today and the cytoskeleton today, this really is a survey lecture meant to give you a very broad overview of some of the things we'll be talking about in the second half of the semester. We have lectures or pairs of lectures that delve very deeply into many of these topics. So again, we're just getting accustomed to this. You'll find much of this lecture to be review, and that's by design. So. We are on to the cell biology portion of our course. There's no doubt about it. We are done with molecular biology, and we're right on schedule. This is our 10th lecture out of 20. We are halfway through our course. In this lecture, we're going to cover, again, the very basics of cell biology, just setting the stage for ourselves as we launch into this second unit of the course. And so, yes, most of this lecture will be a review for you, and that's intentional. Uh, if you do find any concepts from this lecture especially troublesome, let me know right away so that I know that I need to review those basics before we get into greater detail. It should come as no surprise to any of you that all living things are made of cells on this planet. Cells are defined as usually small, although not necessarily small, membrane-enclosed units, or sacs, filled with mostly fluid and biomolecules as well as some specialized membrane inside the cell. What makes cells truly unique, and I'll go out on a limb here and sound a little bit melodramatic and call cells magical, miraculous, is that as cells grow, they move, and most importantly, they divide into two new, smaller, yet identical cells. Cells reproduce, and that is the defining quality of life. Cells can divide, making two cells from one, and that is what distinguishes living things from non-living things, independent uh, growth and reproduction. Nothing else in the known universe can do that, can divide, can grow, can propagate itself, but living cells, but life. So cells can exist as single, solitary units. We know that because we talk about microorganisms uh, on a pretty regular basis. Bacteria, yeast, protists such as amoeba and uh, euglena, paramecium, things you haven't thought of since your first year here as a biology major. But of course, we also have multicellular organisms as well, also made of cells. So today we'll discuss both single-celled organisms as well as multicelled organisms and highlight their differences. And I'm sure you already have an appreciation for the fact that cells can vary enormously in the way that they look as well as in what they do. Much of this goes without saying, but cells, of course, vary in their size. Some cells are a few micrometers across, that is one millionth of a meter, or uh, 10 to the minus sixth meters, to uh, millimeters across which is one thousandth of a meter, or ten to the minus three meters. And please keep in mind, although the words are quite similar, from micrometer to millimeter, that's one thousand times difference in size. In other words, a cell that is one millimeter across is one thousand times bigger than a cell that is a micrometer across. Cells vary in their shapes as well. Here we see a neuron, a paramecium, some plant cells, and a motile, moving, spiraling bacterial cell. These are all cells. These are all single cells. And look at their morphological differences. Look how different they are. 
that single neuron cell is extremely branched and elongated, uh, very specialized. The paramecium is a single cell, yet it appears to be covered in hair. Of course, we know that's cilia, but that's a single cell right there uh, in the left of center. Plant cells are very regular, like building blocks or Lego blocks, because they're encased in a cell wall. And those modal bacteria tend to be spiral-shaped, allowing them to spiral and move their way through a fluid much more easily. In addition to the different shapes, please note the scale of these organisms. Uh, I'm sorry, of these cells. The neuron, the scale of that image is 100 micrometers. Uh, that's about uh, 0.1 millimeters. The paramecium we're looking at, the scale on that image is 25 micrometers. 10 micrometers is the scale for the plant cells. 0.5 micrometers is the size of the bacteria. So although the bacteria and the paramecium look a little bit similar in size in their pictures, in fact the paramecium is many, many, many times larger than the bacterial cell in true size. Much as the case for proteins, for cells, their shape often implies their function, and that's no mistake even in this image. Uh, neurons are very extended and branched in this way because they need to make multiple contacts with multiple cells, indeed hundreds if not thousands of different contacts with thousands of different cells, and so they take on this branched appearance to allow that. The paramecium is covered in cilia so that it can swim more readily and um, bring food to its gullet or its oral groove. Uh, by sw swimming or sweeping food in that direction. Plant cells are building blocks for the larger plant organism, and so they have that structure. And we talked already about the corkscrew appearance of the modal bacteria. So their shape uh, not only makes them unique, but specializes them for their function. So these cells behave differently as a result of their size and shape, as well as look differently. Some cells are surrounded only by a membrane. Our own cells are no exception to that. Others, as we already said, like plant cells, have cell walls. Keep in mind, bacterial cells are often covered in cell walls. Yeast cells are also coated in cell walls. This isn't unique only to plants. Some cells are surrounded by a layer of slime to protect them from, let's say, an acidic environment, such as our own gut. And some cells are protected and coated in a mineralized shell, such as the diatoms that I'm sure you discussed in general biology as well. These cells also differ in their specific chemistries. Most cells on this planet that are aerobic make ATP from oxygen and glucose or some other sugar. But there are some cells that are anaerobic and can survive in the absence of oxygen. They require a completely different chemistry. Some cells are autotrophic, meaning they make their own food through photosynthesis or other related processes. But most cells on this planet are heterotrophic, meaning they take the substances of life, the organic molecules of other dead cells, and ingest it and use that for energy. And so I hope you can appreciate the things that make different cells different are vastly different. Their sizes, their shapes, their chemistries. And so each of these differences between cells is an opportunity to understand what makes cells tick. But living cells, all living cells on this planet, also share a great deal of similarity between each other, especially in their very basic biochemistry. With so much variation between cells and so many differences, the things that all cells must share in common must be really important, indeed critical for survival. Otherwise, with so many differences, why would they share any similarities at all? The things that cells have in common, they have in common because they must have them in common in order to survive. So in fact, these shared similarities that all cells have are probably things that all life must do to survive. All living cells grow, and they reproduce. But all living cells are also energy conversion factories. They convert energy from one form to another. They control and coordinate their internal processes, and they have to, in order to be life, respond to and adapt to environmental changes. All living things on this planet, at least, use DNA as their central information-containing repository. They use DNA for their protein coding information. And again, by DNA, of course, we mean chains of nucleotides, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, that make up protein coding genes as well as intergenic regions. The process of DNA replication is virtually the same in every single cell. <clears throat> in fact, what we said about DNA replication earlier in this course, 
was harnessed and learned from bacterial cells. We learned those facts from bacterial cells, yet we can teach them in a cell biology course that's specialized in eukaryotic cells because how bacteria replicate their DNA is exactly how we replicate ours. The speeds change a bit, the names of the proteins change a bit, but the basic principles are exactly the same. Transcription is the same in every cell. Every cell undergoes transcription to make an mRNA of its DNA gene, and that process is inherently the same in all living cells on this planet. Translation is the same in every cell. Again, there are subtle differences in the details, but every single living cell on this planet has a ribosome of similar shape and function that decodes the information contained in a messenger RNA in a very much the same way. And so what we are really saying is that the central dogma of molecular biology is truly central, and it holds true in every cell that has been discovered by science thus far. DNA contains the information for building proteins. That information is copied into a smaller usable form of RNA through the process of transcription, and that RNA is then decoded and translated in order to make a chain of amino acids or protein uh, in translation. In addition, the similarities don't stop there. Proteins are the biological machines of life for every living cell on this planet. It is proteins that keep cells alive on Earth, and that is true for all cells on Earth. These proteins are structural, such as the microtubules we're working with in lab. They are catalytic. All of the enzymes we've discussed so far have been proteins that catalyze chemical reactions uh, in a protein-dependent way. They can be motor proteins, which we'll talk about later on this course, signaling proteins, etc. If it is critical for life and it requires an activity, proteins are most likely carrying that activity out, and those proteins came from genes that encoded them. So that leads us to the philosophical question of then what is life, and where did life come from? To truly understand what we mean by alive, let's take a moment and talk about zombies. Not just any run-of-the-mill, awesome TV show, Walking Dead zombies, but real-life zombies. Viruses. Viruses are zombies. By viruses, we mean any par particle or any structure that has a protein shell and some type of nucleic acid information bank in its center. This is the classic image of a virus that you're probably used to seeing, these little uh, moon lander capsules. These are unique to bacterial viruses. These are viruses that can infect bacterial cells, but viruses come in all shapes and sizes. Most of the viruses that make us sick come in these spherical um, shapes. But again, it's a protein shell carrying a nucleic acid center. Viruses are essentially nothing more than genetic information, DNA or RNA, wrapped in a protective protein capsule. That's all they are, yet they can wreak such havoc. Viruses do not fit even the most basic definition of life. They cannot reproduce themselves independently. A virus with nothing more than itself cannot make two baby viruses from one. They cannot reproduce independently. Viruses also do not fit the other definitions of life. They cannot convert energy from one form to another on their own. They cannot adapt to changing environmental situations. They are chemical zombies. They are seemingly alive, but not. Very much like zombies, viruses can't do anything without a living host to feed on. Once a virus can infect a living cell, then it can reproduce itself. Then it can convert energy. Then it can adapt and mutate and change. But only once infecting a living host cell. On their own, without a host cell to take over, zombies cannot do any of these things. Somewhere between 3.8 and 3.5 billion years ago, life was born on this planet. Somewhere in an ocean, a single cell sparked. Uh, more accurately, a membrane-bound sac of a bunch of biomolecules suddenly sprang into independent reproduction and became truly alive. That one protocell, that one ancestor cell, it grew and it divided on its own without any other requirements. It grew and divided, thus defining life. The descendant cells that came from that first changed and adapted they mutated. They did things a little bit differently, and they specialized for different environments. And the changes made these cells different from one another, of course. Unique. Some of these 
new daughter cells that arose from the first were better than others, they survived more efficiently, some were worse and died more rapidly. Some were specialized and did better at some temperatures, others were specialized and did better at different temperatures. Those cells continue to grow and divide, continue to change, continue to mutate and adapt, their descendant cells constantly changing and mutating, some for the better, some for the worse, some more specialized, some just poor survivors. And thus life began to evolve. Evolution by just allowing those that were most suited to survive to continue surviving, and seeing to it that those that were not fit for survival died off rapidly, evolution, survival of the fittest, steered the path of life as it continued to grow, divide, and colonize this earth. Because we all came from this single cell floating in a single ocean, because we all have the same great 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 grandmother cell, we are all alike in many, many ways. This is why we share so many similarities in our basic biochemistry. Because we are all cousins, all sprung from that single ancestral cell. Yet this same theory of evolution explains why we are all so different from each other. We're all so different because we've taken very different roads and paths down time from that ancestral cell to be so specialized for what we are. So we have inside ourselves, in our biochemistry and in our DNA, the signatures, the remnants of that ancestor cell we all came from. But we've had a lot of time to diverge and differ and change relative to one another, and so we are also very unique and specialized and different. So from there, it makes sense to go, not philosophical, but scientific. Let's talk about studying life, not from the philosophical evolutionary point of view, but studying life for what it is, how it looks, and how it behaves. And that brings us to the very intimate relationship between cell biology as a field of science and the microscope as the primary um, instrument used to study it. Most cells can't be seen with the naked eye. They're just too small. They're beyond what we can see with the unaided eye. And so it wasn't until the invention of the microscope in the 1600s were cells even known to exist as much as they do, uh, to be as prevalent as they are, to be the underlying structure of all life. It wasn't known before that. In the 1600s, Robert Hooke, a, a scientist who was using a microscope, looked at cork under a very, very early and primitive microscope. And what he saw when he looked at cork was the hollow remains, actually the empty cell walls, of the former cork tree cells. This is what he saw in his primitive microscope. This is cork under the microscope. And you can see the cell walls remain, but nothing is inside of them. They're empty and hollow now. That's what makes cork so spongy. And, uh, but you can see, obviously, the remnants of the cells that were there. When Robert Hooke looked at these, they reminded him very much of the hard, uh, cubic rooms that monks used to sleep in in the time. Uh, so these were the quarters that monks would sleep in uh, before Robert Hooke's time, but these were well known, and these were called cells, almost like prison cells. So the monks would sleep in these cells. Since the objects that Robert Hooke was seeing under his microscope looked so much like these monk cells for sleeping, he called these structures the same thing. He called them cells, and the name has stuck ever since. Obviously, as the case for all technology, as time passed, microscopes became easier to make, easier to obtain, more widespread, and therefore cheaper, so more and more scientists were able to get their hands on microscopes. <clears throat> so scientists the world over began observing the microscopic world. And think of it, it must have been just an amazing time. Every day was a new discovery. Every drop of pond water put under the microscope was something new to be seen. New discoveries were being made and reported monthly. Uh, just an amazing time, an amazing growth of human knowledge based on this simple device, this simple magnifying device of two lenses that we take for granted today. Based on what all these scientists were seeing, the cell theory was born. The cell theory is a very, very simple theory, but it is the underlying theory that governs all of cell biology. Simply put, the cell theory says that all living cells are formed by the division of pre-existing cells and inherit characteristics from those pre-existing cells. That's the cell theory. 
that all things are made of cells and that all cells came from previous cells except of course that one ancestor cell just one cell long long ago in that ocean that is the only cell in the history of life on earth that did not come from a living cell before it just one because all cells came from previous cells and all cells can trace themselves back to that one ancestor cell we are all intimately related to one another all life on this planet is intimately related and we are all directly linked to the past in a very real way with better microscopes came better views of the cell. And scientists could see the interior of the cell as well as the exterior remnants of cell walls. They could see the nucleus of the cell. They could see the cytoplasm in motion. They could see organelles. All of these structures inside the cell bound by internal membranes. They saw the outside environment of the cell, cells that were part of tissues of larger organisms as well, the so-called extracellular matrix, or ECM, which we will talk about later on in the course. They saw the plasma membrane of the cell itself, its border or its barrier protecting it from the environment. They saw things moving and floating in the cell in a very coordinated and intentional way. They watched the cell move if it was a modal cell, as it crawled along the surface or swam through the media or corkscrewed its way across the microscope viewing stand. And most amazingly, damn it, they watched those cells divide. They could catch cells in the middle of mitosis and watch two cells form from one all under their microscope. Knowing how important these observations were and recognizing how critical it was to start to define these structures and understand what they did, scientists started to develop dyes. And these dyes would preferentially stain different parts or components of the cell, helping to make sense of the interior. We had dyes created that were specific to nuclei, nuclei uh, that st stained the DNA. Dyes that would adhere to and stain only the cytoplasm. Dyes that would adhere to and only stain the cell membrane that would stain the mitochondria, that would stain other organelles, etc. Now, scientists didn't necessarily know what structures were being stained at the time, but they did know that some of the structures were being stained and others weren't, and at least they could begin to categorize and classify different parts of the cell. In the mid-1990s, I'm sorry, in the mid-1950s, I believe it was, the uh, electron microscope was invented. This gave far better magnification. Now cells were being illuminated not with light waves, but with much smaller electron waves, giving a much better um, resolution to the image that could be observed. Electron microscopy allowed us to see individual functions and, and um individual structures of the nucleus, the mitochondria, uh, smaller organelles that hadn't been observed before then, such as the lysosome and peroxisome, fine order structures such as the endoplasmic reticulum, all became visible. After electron microscopy, we got fluorescent microscopy invented, which gave better staining and differentiation. Again, we'll be using fluorescent microscopy microscopy in our own lab later on in the semester. With fluorescent microscopy we could do the dyeing or staining that had already been developed but do it in a way that made it much easier to see what was going on. Here we have three stains in this muscle cell. We have a DAPI stain which is staining the DNA blue or purple so that identifies the nucleus. We have our green microtubules much like we will have in our lab staining the cytoskeleton green as we can see there. And we have a mitochondrial stain that is staining the mitochondria uh, dark orange or red. Um, obviously, being a muscle cell, this cell requires a great number of mitochondria because it requires a great number of ATP molecules, a lot of energy, and so we see many, many thousands of mitochondria spread throughout this cell. And finally, with all of this microscopy and all of these wonderful techniques, we began to truly understand the cell in some large, comprehensive, all-inclusive way. So now let's, of course, talk about cells, different cells. Let's first talk about bacteria, because they're simpler, and as always is the case, we can get some of the basics down, and then we'll move on to the more complicated eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells include not only bacteria, but also archaeal cells. Archaeal cells are the most ancient cells we know of. Bacterial cells come in all different shapes and sizes. Their classes for shapes are the spherical cells. Streptococcus is a good example of this. The rod-shaped bacteria, such as E. coli. And we have spiral-shaped bacteria as well. The archaeal cells tend to only come in these oblong uh, spherical shapes, similar to the rod-shaped cells of bacteria. 
Uh, we don't have any other shapes for archaeal cells that we have seen thus far. Prokaryotic cells, whether they're bacterial or archaeal, lack organelles. They only have one membrane. That's the membrane that surrounds the cell itself. They have no other membrane-bound organelles, and that includes nuclei. So there's no membrane-bound nuclei in prokaryotic cells. All that we have is a membrane-bound cell and everything inside of it floating together in the soup of the cytoplasm, including the DNA. Prokaryotes are very, very simple, but they are streamlined, economized, stripped-down life. Uh, in fact, many, many things on this planet don't survive nearly as well as bacterial cells do, and I firmly believe that when we have managed as humans to toxify this planet and make it unsuitable for all life of any kind, there will still be prokaryotic cells colonizing the last habitable niches of the Earth because they are the most durable. We've learned a lot from life about prokaryotes. We share a lot of similarities with them, and their basic, basic ways of survival are the same as how our own cells survive. Prokaryotes are extremely numerous. There's no cell type on Earth with more cell number than prokaryotes. They divide very, very rapidly. It takes about 20 minutes for a bacterial cell to divide under ideal conditions. And they do have sex. Those of you who have had me for genetics know this. Bacterial cells exchange DNA, exchange genetic material with one another in real time in a single generation, and that is the definition of sex, which doesn't always have to be synonymous with reproduction. And so we have horizontal gene transfer as well as vertical gene transfer. Uh, we have a great deal of opportunity for genetic variation and genetic shuffling, even in prokaryotic cells. This is an example of conjugation of bacterial sex where a conjugation bridge has been made between two bacterial cells and DNA can be shunted through that conjugation bridge from a donor cell to a recipient cell. Prokaryotic cells evolve very rapidly. Due to this rapid evolution, they are constantly exploiting new and habitable niches for survival. They are single-celled organisms, but they can grow in clumps, so they can even uh, harness the benefit of safety in numbers that we see in multicellular organisms. They can grow in chains, they can grow in films. In fact, biofilms, bacterial films, are some of the um, most dangerous problems that hospitals are now facing. These bacterial films are very, very hard to kill. The bacteria protect themselves very robustly in these biofilms. Uh, again, that safety in numbers idea. They shield themselves from antibiotic treatment, and they tend to coat plastics really well, and most surgical supplies are made of plastics. And so if you do have a bad hospital-induced nosocomial infection, it's most likely due to a biofilm that was very stubbornly adhered to something that the hospital was using in the treatment of that patient. And prokaryotes live everywhere. They live in the dirt, of course. They live in our own gut. They live in volcanic mud. They live thousands of feet under the ice in Arctic ice caps. They live everywhere. Some of these prokaryotic cells are aerobic, and they breathe very much the way we breathe. They take in oxygen and use that oxygen to make ATP uh, using a process called oxidative phosphorylation, which you probably heard about in biochemistry if you've taken that course. Other prokaryotic cells are anaerobic and are killed by oxygen, find oxygen to be toxic, and they make their ATP in oxygen-independent ways. It is now widely accepted that our own mitochondria are in fact the evolutionary remains of an aerobic small bacterial cell that was engulfed by a larger anaerobic predatory cell. Upon this engulfment, the smaller cell was not digested for whatever reason, but instead was allowed to continue to survive within the confines of the larger predatory cell. Because that smaller cell was aerobic, it continued to be aerobic, and it continued to breathe within the larger cell using oxygen to make ATP. This is a very efficient way to make ATP, using oxygen. And so the smaller cell started providing a great deal of ATP and energy to the larger cell. See, now the larger cell was being benefited by the smaller cell's presence because of all this extra energy being made in a very efficient way. The smaller cell was being benefited as well. If survival is the name of the game and the only danger of a small bacterium is being eaten, the small bacterium was already eaten and there's no other danger to be had. In fact, the smaller cell was being kept safe within the larger cell.
And so it was a true symbiotic relationship where the smaller cell was being kept protected by the larger cell, and in return, the smaller cell was making ATP for the larger cell. So the larger cell failed to digest the smaller, and the smaller cell continued respiring. That relationship continued and evolved, making a independent, almost free-living organelle within our own cells that make ATP. In fact, this is what mitochondria are. Mitochondria are ATP-making factories, but they still have some of their free-living remnants, such as their own genome. You may or may not know that mitochondria have their own circular, bacteria-like genome that they carry with them. So in each one of your cells, you have two genomes. You have your nuclear genome, which is the genome we're always referring to, but you also have a mitochondrial genome that is unique and specific to your mitochondria. Mitochondria do their own transcription and their own translation. They make their own proteins, and they also grow and divide independently of the cell. A cell that once had 10 mitochondria can easily have 40 after a given amount of time because the mitochondria grow and divide within that larger cell. And in all ways, morphologically, genetically, and all other ways you can imagine, mitochondria have far more in common with their own bacterial ancestors than they do with anything that we have as eukaryotic cells. Chloroplasts in plants actually arose the same way. Chloroplasts were uh, a second eaten cell, this time an autotrophic cell that was eaten by a larger predatory cell. And the same story holds true. It was not digested but maintained, and this ingested cell imparted uh, autotrophic behavior to this larger cell and eventually gave rise to plants. Uh, chloroplasts have their own genome, much like mitochondria do, but of course we didn't reap the benefits of that. We're on a different evolutionary branch, and we are not photosynthetic. We have to eat our food. We can't make it. So bacteria and archaea. They're as different from one another as either is different from us. We can't group these together as very similar cell types. They're not. Just because you're little and single-celled and don't have a nucleus doesn't mean you're the same. Bacteria and archaea are uniquely different. Most archaeal species are what we refer to as extremophiles. They like extreme environments. Archaeal cells live in some of the harshest, most extreme, unhabitable environments that are available on Earth. Very, very salty water. Brine is what we call it. Uh, where the salt concentrations are much too high for life, well, archaea is there, thriving and living and surviving. The volcanic springs that we find near volcanoes all around the world, that water is not only exceedingly hot, it's also exceedingly acidic. Some of this water has a pH of zero. That's how acidic they are. That's how high the proton concentration is in this water. Uh, no living cell can possibly hope to survive in this water except archaea. Archaea is there and thriving. At the depths of the ocean floor, where there is no, not only no oxygen to be had, but also excruciatingly intense pressures, no living thing can survive uh, at the depths of the ocean floor. But archaea is there, surviving and thriving. Sewage sludge, archaea is there. Uh, industrial waste, archaea is there. The harsh intestinal tracts of herbivores, Archaea is there. In fact, archaea are the cell types that break down cellulose in cow stomachs and allow the glucose molecules in that cellulose to be released. These environments are extremely harsh, and they probably resemble uh, the young earth, the harsh, brutal, and changing environments of a young, primordial earth. And so it leads many to wonder if archaea were the first cell types to evolve on this planet. Was that first proto-cell, that ancestor cell, an archaeal cell, an extremophile, that could not only survive on the harsh young earth's environment, but thrive there? But enough learning about other things. Let's learn about us. We are a narcissistic group in this class, and we want to know how we work. And we are not prokaryotes. We are most definitely eukaryotic. The defining characteristic of eukaryotes is that they contain membrane-bound organelles, membranes inside their cell uh, that define and characterize their organelles, including, and most importantly, a membrane-bound nucleus to store the DNA. This is the uh, common schematic of a eukaryotic cell. It's far more complicated than a prokaryotic cell, and we see all of these different membrane-bound regions. In fact, everything you see that's labeled in this schematic has its own unique membrane defining it and enclosing it.
In general, eukaryotic cells are larger and more complex than prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotes range from very simple-celled organisms, such as protists, like we said, amoeba and um, uh, paramecium, etc. Yeast also is a single-celled eukaryote. To the most awesomest, coolest, bestest organism ever, human beings, of course. So in this way, the range of different morphologies and complexities and sizes in eukaryotic cells far exceeds what we see in prokaryotic cells. There's just many, many different varieties, more varieties of eukaryotic cells on this earth than there are different varieties of prokes. As the remainder of this course, we'll be focusing on cell biology and largely the cell biology of eukaryotes because prokaryotic cell biology courses are referred to as microbiology courses, and you've had that already. So since you've taken microbiology, you've had prokaryotic cell biology. This is a course on eukaryotic cell biology. We will spend the rest of this lecture just briefly surveying the inside of a general eukaryotic cell uh, just to get the basics down and then we'll delve deeper into the details of all of these as the course progresses. So let's talk about the organelles. Let's get the lay of the land of the typical eukaryotic cell and let's start with the most important organelle, the brain of the cell, the nucleus. The nucleus is actually enclosed by two membranes which come together to form what we refer to as the nuclear envelope. It is the only doubly bound organelle in the cell. The nucleus contains the DNA of the cell. Well, we already knew that, of course. And it's also the site of all dependent, DNA-dependent cellular processes. So transcription occurs in the nucleus. DNA repair occurs in the nucleus. The wrapping of chromatin occurs in the nucleus, of course. The mitochondria, we already gave it away a little bit, but the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. These mitochondria are extremely numerous. Here the mitochondria are stained green. Again, the DNA is stained blue. Each green dot is a single mitochondria, so cells have a large, large numbers of mitochondria because cells need lots and lots of ATP. Mitochondria are present in almost every conceivable eukaryotic cell you can imagine. They are typically shaped like a kidney bean, and they are usually drawn as such. They are the second most recognizable cellular structure after the nucleus because they do have this very unique and constant shape. Mitochondria are also enclosed by two membranes, but very, very different from the nuclear, nuclear two membranes. We'll talk about why when we get to the membrane structure lecture. The outer membrane is a typical membrane. It's very round and gives that kidney bean shape. The inner membrane is convoluted, much like the human brain. It's folded in on itself over and over again. If we go back to this image, we'll see the outer membrane outlines the uh, shape of the, of the mitochondria. But that inner membrane is the one that you see moving back and forth, back and forth. This schematic also shows it well. It actually matches the electron micrograph in the center quite well. The outer membrane in this image is in light blue. The inner membrane is in pink, convoluted, folded, jammed into the center of the mitochondria. The reason for this folding and convolution is to increase the surface area of that inner membrane to get as much inner membrane crammed into the mitochondria as can fit. And that's because respiration occurs across the inner membrane. If you have taken biochemistry, you've heard about things such as glycolysis and the electron transport chain. You've heard about the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. The vast majority of those processes occur at or across the inner membrane of the mitochondria, including oxidative phosphorylation itself. So the production of ATP depends exclusively in an aerobic organism on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. The more inner membrane, the more ATP you can make, the happier the mitochondria is, and so a lot of inner membrane means a very productive mitochondria. Again, bringing back memories from biochemistry or preparing future memories to come from biochemistry if you haven't taken the course yet. Glucose comes into the cell. A process called glycolysis converts one molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. We then quickly, with a few reactions, turn that pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA is fed into the citric acid cycle. We start ripping off electrons from acetyl-CoA in the citric acid cycle. That's really the only point of the citric acid cycle, is to harness electrons, and those electrons are fed into the electron transport chain.
through the electron transport chain, we turn that electron energy into a, a gradient of protein. Essentially, we create a, a dam across the inner mitochondrial membrane with a lot of proton on one side and very little proton on the other. And like all dams and all uh, pent-up water or protons, those protons want to flow. And when we let them flow across the inner mitochondrial membrane, we make ATP uh, through the oxidative phosphorylation process. So the energy contained in those high-powered electrons that were stripped off of what was acetyl-CoA, but pyruvate and glucose originally, is released and recaptured by mitochondrial proteins at the inner mitochondrial membrane, and that's how we make ATP. That's essentially the second half of biochemistry in about 45 seconds. To do all of this, mitochondria need oxygen, and they release as a byproduct carbon dioxide. This is why we need oxygen. We breathe in order to provide mitochondria with the oxygen they need for this chemistry, and we exhale carbon dioxide because that's the waste that the mitochondria made. So you see that oxygen is needed at certain steps, and carbon dioxide is released at other steps. Without mitochondria and without this biochemistry, much of the food we ate would be undigestible in the sense that we couldn't extract energy from it. And we would promptly die due to a starvation of ATP. Not enough energy to keep surviving. So although the nucleus is critically important as the information repository of the cell, the brain of the cell, really what's keeping us alive more than anything else is our mitochondria, providing us with the energy we need to stay organized and living. Although it doesn't pertain to us, we will talk about chloroplasts very quickly. Stop being so egocentric. It's not all about you, after all. We can learn about other things as well. Plants are eukaryotic, so they fall under the umbrella of this course, and they are much more like us than they are different. But plants are lucky. They're autotrophs. They make their own food. Therefore, they can stay pit put. They don't have to walk around because they don't have to hunt. They don't have to eat. They can stay put in a nice, sunny area and live their whole life in one spot, making their own food every time the sun comes out. We are heterotrophs. We need to eat other things. And what's most critical when you're a heterotroph is you've got to be able to move around. Because if you stay put in one spot, you can't count on the food always coming to you. So we are modal organisms because we need to find our food and eat our food. We can't make it for ourselves. Plants and many forms of algae are photosynthetic due to the presence of chloroplasts in their cells. Chloroplasts did arise from an ingested bacterium long, long ago. The chloroplast structure is extremely complex, and it's convoluted very much like the mitochondria. There are multiple membrane layers stacked upon one another, and a lot of chemistry occurs at these inner chloroplatic membranes. Most chloroplasts are filled with a green pigmented molecule referred to as chlorophyll. And chlorophyll allows these chloroplasts to absorb energy from sunlight directly and shunt or shuttle that energy to biochemical processes. That energy, harnessed from sunlight, essentially performs respiration in reverse. That's all photosynthesis is. See, when we exhale, we exhale carbon dioxide and water. You knew that any time you saw your own breath on a, on a very cold day, that's your water vapor exhalate coming out. So we exhale carbon dioxide and water. What did we take in? Well, we took in oxygen and sugar. So we take in oxygen and sugar and we break it down to carbon dioxide and water. Well, gee, that's funny. What do plants take in? Plants take in carbon dioxide and water, don't they? And what do they make from that? Sugar and oxygen. So photosynthesis is nothing more than respiration in reverse. Now, the biochemistry is different. There's a lot of different reactions that do that. But essentially, photosynthesis is nothing more than respiration in reverse, taking carbon dioxide and water and using them together to make sugar, sugar and oxygen. And we, as heterotrophs, eat sugar and oxygen and break it down to carbon dioxide and water. Now, we get our energy from the, carbon di from the sugar and the oxygen. Plants get their energy from the sun. What plants really do is make their own sugar and oxygen with energy from the sun, and then they eat that sugar and respire the same way we do. So chloroplasts take in water and carbon dioxide, and from them make sugar and release oxygen. The sugar is theirs to eat. They feed that sugar to their own mitochondria to survive, and the oxygen, lucky for us, is for us to breathe and continue surviving on this planet. Wonderful, wonderful systems here.
Now, there's a lot of biochemistry in those organelles, a lot of interesting stuff as well. We will talk more about the cellular phenomenon of those organelles as we delve into them more deeply. Uh, we will not talk about the biochemistry, unfortunately. That is, of course, reserved for the biochemistry course. Now, on to what are the more boring organelles, unfortunately. There are many, many other membrane-bound organelles in the typical eukaryotic cell. And they are also critical for cellular function. We couldn't survive as well without them. The endoplasmic reticulum is our probably next most important organelle. This is a complex maze of membrane that is involved in protein production and protein modifications. When actually, many biomolecules are made by the endoplasmic reticulum. The rough ER is, it appears to be rough because it's studded or coated in active ribosomes. These ribosomes are churning out proteins by the tonnage. And so the rough ER is the site of protein synthesis. Specifically, it makes proteins that are destined to be secreted by the cell. And this is what the rough ER looks like under an electron microscope. The smooth ER is smooth because it's not studded with ribosomes, therefore it is not the site of protein production. Instead, the smooth ER makes some specialized carbohydrates that we need for our cells to survive well. Also, many lipids are made in the smooth ER. So, uh, and this is what the smooth ER looks like under electron microscopy. So all endoplasmic reticuli are sites of biomolecule production, with the rough ER basically specialized to secreted proteins and the smooth ER specialized to sugars and lipids. That brings us to the Golgi. The Golgi complex is actually a series of different complexes all sandwiched and squeezed together. The Golgi complex is made up of stacks of flattened, fully enclosed membrane sacs. The Golgi is the site of post-translational modifications of proteins. So this is where proteins get their extra doodads added onto them. Extra sugar groups, extra modifications, accessory factors that allow them to specialize their function. Many proteins have doodads added to them. Sugars added to proteins, lipids added to proteins, methyl groups, etc. And these are modifications that occur to the protein after the proteins have been translated. That's why we call them post-translational modifications. The Golgi receives newly made proteins from the rough ER. That's what enters the Golgi complex. And the Golgi complex acts very much like an assembly line. It takes those proteins from the rough ER and modifies them adds those extras, adds those sugar groups, those lipid groups, those methyl groups, etc. And then on the other end of that factory line of the Golgi, those proteins emerge fully modified. The Golgi is also the warehouse of the proteins in the cell, and so it is the site of sorting and trafficking. Proteins that need to go to different locations are routed to those locations based on how they emerge out of the Golgi and what type of package they are in. As these biomolecules leave the Golgi, they leave destin and fully routed to their final cellular or outside extracellular destination. So the Golgi is very much the shipping warehouse of the cell. It takes in the raw materials, modifies them, packages them, makes sure that they're quality controlled and ready to go, and then sends them out the other end destined to where they belong. Lysosomes are the stomachs of the cell. They are the sites of intracellular digestion. They contain very dangerous digestive enzymes, enzymes that are capable of breaking down complex sugars, complex lipids, even proteins. Lysosomes also have a very low pH, much like our own stomach does. They're very high in proton concentration. Therefore, lysosomes generate and release nutrients to the rest of the cell. They really are the stomach of the cell. Peroxisomes do what it sounds like they do. They are the site of hydrogen peroxide formation or breakdown. Cells often need hydrogen peroxide as part of their normal biochemical processes, but this hydrogen peroxide is extremely dangerous. Hydrogen peroxide breaks down very readily to water, which is completely safe, and a single oxygen atom, what we call a monoatomic oxygen, which is a free radical, very, very dangerous, um, very dangerous to the cell. These free radicals generated when hydrogen peroxide breaks down are some of the most dangerous things for a cell to have in them. And so it makes sense then to have a place where water can break down into, I'm sorry, where hydrogen peroxide can break down into water and free radical oxygen together. 
Because when two hydrogen peroxides break down simultaneously, you get two water molecules and a completely harmless molecular oxygen molecule, O2. That's not going to hurt anybody. So if you keep all of your peroxide together in the same place and you keep it sequestered away from the rest of the cell, not only do your free radicals have nothing to interact with because they are sequestered away, but the free radicals will interact with each other. O1 and O1 will interact together making harmless O2, and that's what we want to happen. So peroxisomes provide a safe, contained, segregated place where hydrogen peroxide can be used and allowed to break down without hurting any of the rest of the cell. And then there are vesicles. Vesicles are small, small bubbles of membrane that are used as shipping crates in the cell. They are the transport containers of the cell, and although we're going to give vesicles short shrift here in this lecture, because we're trying to get a broad survey of all that there is in the cell, these vesicles are perhaps some of the most important structures in the cell, and we will spend quite a bit of time on them later on in a couple weeks in this semester. Vesicles are responsible for taking things into the cell through penocytosis, the pinching in of the membrane. It is through vesicles that things are released from the cell when vesicles fuse with the cellular membrane and spill their contents out into the extracellular environment. But also vesicles are how things get from one part of the cell to another. So if biomolecules are moving around in a cell, they are moving around in vesicles, you can be sure. Is it an organelle? No, but the cytoplasm is a critically important structure of the cell. The cytoplasm is the rest of the cell. Everything else, everything we haven't discussed yet, everything is cytoplasm. We also call it the cytosol. This is where everything else exists and floats. Actually, there's so much stuff in the cytosol so much protein and sugar, so much fat, so much cytoskeletal components, so many vesicles, so much stuff, that it's hardly a liquid at all. You can't think of the cytosol as this empty ocean of floating stuff. It's much more like a gel, a tight, dense, compacted New York City Times Square on New Year's Eve gel of molecules all kind of shoulder to shoulder crammed into the cell. Sugar metabolism, what I showed you earlier, that, that glucose is converted into pyruvate, the very first steps of that, glycolysis, occurs in the cytosol. And then, once pyruvate is made, that sugar metabolism continues on in the, say it with me now, the mitochondria. All intracellular, non-secreted proteins are also translated by free-floating ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Those secreted proteins were made by the rough endoplasmic reticulum. But if proteins are being made by the cell that stay in the cell, that are never to be secreted from the cell, those proteins are made by free-floating ribosomes that are in the cytoplasm. Indeed, the interior of the cell, the cytoplasm itself, is constantly moving. It actually swirls in a clockwise direction. It's very, very dynamic. And this is due partly to the biochemistry that occurs there but much more due to the many, many things that are moving in a coordinated fashion along the cables of the cytoskeleton. The transport that goes on in the cell causes that cytoplasm to move. So let's wrap up talking about this wonderful cytoskeleton. And we will come back to the cytoskeleton also and sp spend more time on it later on in the semester. The cytoskeleton is the girders and the struts of the cell. It is the structural scaffolding of the cell. Cells have their shape because of their cytoskeleton. So much as we think of buildings being held by I-beams and shock absorbers, these have their protein counterparts within our single cells, and these counterparts are made of protein, of course, and those are the proteins of the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is the girders, the I-beams, the scaffolds, the struts, the shock absorbers of our cells. And this image that you see in the bottom right, we see the different components of the cytoskeleton, each represented by a different color, and you can see it really is a web or a meshwork of protein that is truly permeating all aspects of the cell, holding membrane to membrane, holding the organelles together, keeping everything aligned and coordinated. The cytoskeleton is made of long, fine filaments of protein, and the cytoskeleton literally holds cells together.
gives them their shape and their stability. Most of these filament proteins are anchored on one end at the nucleus and on the other end at the cell membrane. So the nucleus is not only the center and brain of the cell because it contains the DNA, it is also the central hub that most of the cytoskeletal proteins connect to. There are three different protein types that make up the cytoskeleton. There are the microtubules, which we have talked about quite a bit already. They are the largest. There are the intermediate filaments, which are called intermediate filaments because they are of the middle size. And there is actin, which makes up the, the uh, microfilaments of the cytoskeleton. We have in order here the actin filaments in red in a muscle cell, the microtubules being arranged in green in mitotic cells. Hopefully we'll see something very much like this in our own lab. And the intermediate filaments kind of taking the brunt of the structural role of the cytoskeleton died here in blue. The cytoskeleton also provides a system of conduits for the cell. You can think of this as a system of highways. Specialized proteins walk along these protein filaments of the cytoskeleton. And yes, I really mean walk. Wait until you see these things. When we get to the cytoskeletal lecture, you are going to have your mind blown by these walking proteins. They literally walk. These proteins have feet. These proteins walk. Uh, it's crazy. I can't wait to show you guys this stuff. But these walking proteins walk along the protein filaments, and they also have another end, the end opposite of their feet. And on the other end, they hold vesicles. So these walking proteins hold vesicles on one side. Those vesicles, remember, are the cargo containers of the cell. They contain biomolecules. And on the other end of these walking proteins, they are walking along the microtubules. So that's how we get things shipped around the cell. Here we see a very crude schematic of this. The feet of these walking proteins are shown in red and blue. These domains of the protein take the steps, walk along the microtubule along the bottom. But you can see the other end of the protein is adhered to what's labeled as cargo here. That's a vesicle, a membrane-bound vesicle that's containing some cargo, some um, biomolecules that the cell needs to get around. And so by walking along these microtubules, we can move things to and fro throughout the cell. This is the primary means of transport within a single cell. These motor proteins, these walking proteins, the vesicles that they are carrying, and the microtubules they are walking along. In plant cells, the mitochondria themselves appear to swirl around the cell, um, being moved by walking proteins along cytoskeletal components. Why mitochondria swirl in plant cells and uniquely in plant cells, we are still really not too sure. And of course, as, as touched on in genetics, the cytoskeleton also plays a very intimate role in mitosis, pulling cystochromatids apart, constricting the cell membrane for cytokinesis, and we will talk about that as well in the uh, cytoskeletal lectures that are coming up. So although it's kind of thrown in here at the end, and, and many of you may recognize some of these slides from genetics, it's important, I think, at this point to remind everybody that when we do basic research, we are doing it with model organisms. Uh, the reason why I think this fits here is because we do talk quite a bit about evolution in this lecture. We talk a lot about how we're different and how we're the same. We talk a lot about the common ancestor of that single cell. So how can we harness those similarities to learn about ourselves and learn about life? I've told you that all life on this planet evolved from a single common ancestor, that we all sprung from that single cell. But there are implications from that. What does this make possible? Well, what it really makes possible is that if we study life, we're studying life. If life is so similar at its foundation, if life all came from the same place, then if we simply study any form of life on this planet, we are indeed learning more about ourselves because we are all distant cousins. So the other organisms we use and study to learn more about ourselves, we call model organisms. We're using those organisms to model our own processes. There are a surprisingly small and select few model organisms that scientists use. And in general, we try to use the lowest life form possible to get at the answers we're trying to obtain. So if we're studying very, very simple cellular processes, such as DNA replication, why do that in a monkey or a mouse where there's so much complexity and also ethically when there's pain to be inflicted, 
when we can learn just as much about DNA replication by studying very simple cells such as bacterial cells or archaeal cells because indeed these simple prokaryotic cells replicate their DNA exactly as we do because we share the same ancestor. Now if we want to get a little bit more complicated and we're interested in studying something such as nuclear transport we can't use bacteria because bacteria don't have nuclei so we have to use a eukaryotic cell to study nuclear transport but the way that things are transported across the nuclear envelope in yeast is nearly identical to the way things are transported across the nuclear envelope in us so we would use the lowest life form possible single-celled yeast maybe we want to study the development of cell fate the um, establishment of a body axis by that we mean how does a multicellular organism uh, develop into a front end a rear end an anterior end a posterior end etc well yeast isn't part of a multicellular organism yeast doesn't have an anterior and posterior end so we can't use yeast for a question such as that but we can use a very simple small flatworm such as C elegans that's the lowest life form we could use if we want to start learning about senses and behavior, maybe learning and the effects of some chemicals on learning, then we have to use something that has a pretty robust nervous system and something that can learn. And so we can't really use worms for that. We have to go up, but we can use fruit flies. Fruit flies learn. Fruit flies have nervous systems. And so we can use the lowest life form possible, such as fruit flies. And yes, there are advanced eukaryotic processes, such as cancer, and the immune system where we have to use mammals. We have to use mammals because we can't model these phenomena in any other cell type. And when we're faced with that, we do use mammals. We use mice, we use rats, and in rare circumstance, we even use primates. But we try very hard not to. And indeed, in many, many biological questions, we don't need to go to mammalian systems because we can answer our questions using a smaller, uh, more simpler, more ethically humane model organism. And there's even a model organism for plants. The roadside weed, Arabidopsis thaliana, is the most widely used model organism for plant research to understand how all plants work. All of these organisms I have shown you up here have had their genomes sequenced. All of the genetics of these organisms is finely understood. And these are robust model organisms. What makes a model organism ideal is that it has a short life cycle. We need to see generations and generations and generations of these organisms, and so we would prefer that they reproduce very rapidly. Large numbers of progenies are good for statistical significance. If we see some interesting biological phenomenon in one offspring of an animal, and we only got that one offspring. We don't know if that's a weirdo mutation. We don't know if that's real. We want large numbers of progeny so that we can see the statistics of these phenomenon come out in those large numbers. Of course, research is done in a very artificial laboratory environment, so the animal must be able to survive and thrive in that environment. And typically, a smaller animal is a better animal because it takes up less size, it eats less food, it's comfortable in a smaller cage, etc. And yes, it's true to say, it's accurate to say that there are other commonly used laboratory organisms, including cultured human cells and zebrafish. But the ones I've mentioned on the last slide are what we consider our true model organisms, our classical model organisms, the most commonly used model organisms for those types of questions in research. I'll give you one example of the power of model organisms from zebrafish, a less widely used model organism. Zebrafish tends to be used for developmental studies because zebrafish embryos are transparent during development. So you can actually watch what the living cells are doing, doing during embryonic development without actually sacrificing the organism and killing it. What we learned from zebrafish was how skin pigmentation works. Normal zebrafish have the pattern that you see on the left. They have these yellow stripes and very dark black stripes. But there's a mutant zebrafish called the golden mutant, which is more orangey in color, but those stripes are much, much less pronounced in their pigmentation. The reason why these golden mutants have uh, duller, less bright stripes is because they make fewer um, melanin molecules. They have less pigment in those stripes.
Now, we see differences in pigmentation uh, in our own species, of course. We have different complexions across the human condition, and this, too, is due to differences in melanin production. Do nothing more to differences in melanin production in our own skin. By studying the golden mutant, scientists were able to discover and isolate the gene SLC24A5. This gene is mutated in the golden mutant. It's the only mutation in the golden mutant. It's the only reason why the golden mutant makes less melanosomes, because this gene is mutated. And indeed, scientists using comparative genomics, which we've talked about already in this course, uh, scientists found the human version of SLC24A5 in our own genome, and lo and behold, those individuals with the lightest complexions had two mutant forms, Individuals with moderate complexions had one mutant form and one normal allele, and those of us with the darkest complexions had two functional wild-type non-mutated versions of those alleles. Scientists would never have discovered this SLC24A5 gene without the help of the model organism zebrafish steering us in the right direction. This is comparative functional genomics. This is the power of comparative genomics. This is the reason reason for model organisms, and it is due only because of our shared ancestry with that single primordial cell from long, long ago. Please always keep in mind that regardless of what the biological researcher is studying, whether it be bacteria, yeast, plants, mice, they really are studying us in the end. We are all life, and we all share those common fundamental similarities. So what did we talk about in this lecture? Well, we started just saying that all living things are made of cells, defined as usually small membrane-enclosed units filled with fluid and biomolecules. Cell theory says that to be a cell, to be alive, those cells had to have come from pre-existing cells that divided and, as a consequence, inherits characteristics from them. We use prokaryotes as our simple example of uh, cells. We started talking about bacterial cells as well as archaeal cells. These lack membrane-bound organelles. They lack nuclei as well, of course. Many archaeal cells are, are typified by being extremophiles. They exist and thrive in some of the most extreme and harsh environments that this planet has to offer. We moved on to eukaryotes and said that the defining characteristic of eukaryotes is that they contain cells with membrane-bound organelles, the most important of which is the nucleus. And from there we took the tour, the very basic broad view tour of the typical eukaryotic cell. We talked about the nucleus being enclosed by two membranes which come together to form the nuclear envelope, and the nucleus is of course the home of the DNA. We talked about mitochondria also being enclosed by two membranes, but they are due to the engulfment of an aerobic bacteria that was eaten long, long ago, but maintained by our cells. And so bacteria are, are our aerobic powerhouses. They are responsible for cellular respiration and ATP production. Plants and algae are photosynthetic because they engulfed a second autotrophic bacterial cell way back when that was capable of harnessing the energy of sunlight and use that energy to do respiration in reverse and make sugar and oxygen from carbon dioxide and water. That is photosynthesis. We moved on to the endoplasmic reticulum and said that this is the site of biomolecule synthesis. The rough ER makes secreted proteins. The smooth ER makes some specialized sugars and lipids. The Golgi complex is the warehouse of the cell. Proteins come into the Golgi kind of in their crude, unfinished state. They are post-translationally modified in the Golgi and then sorted and shipped via vesicles to their final destination throughout the cell. We very briefly talked about the roles of the lysosomes, which are the stomachs of the cell, the peroxisomes, which allow for the generation and breakdown of hydrogen peroxide very safely in the cell, membrane-bound vesicles, which are nothing more than empty cargo containers of the cell, and the cytoplasm itself. We spent a little bit of time reviewing the cytoskeleton made up of microfilaments or actin molecules, microtubules or tubulin molecules, and the intermediate filaments, and we talked a little bit about how the cytoskeleton is used not only structurally to keep the cell's shape and keep it intact, but also functionally as the shipping conduits and throughways, the highways of the cell.
And finally, we wrapped up the lecture by talking about model organisms, bringing this all together, giving you some examples of how we can study other organisms and still learn about ourselves, because we all, in fact, come from the same exact ancestor. We all share so much more than we are different. Thank you very much for watching, as always, and I'll hit you with another lecture just as soon as you can stand it.